Hello and welcome. My name is Helen Sprott. I'm Executive Director here at NMC Recordings, and I'm delighted to welcome you again to this new edition of The Listening Club, where we bring you the composers behind the catalogue. Tonight, we're hosting a conversation with Tansy Davis and Stephen Newbold, who is the former Artistic Director of the Birmingham Contemporary Music Group. And we're going to be talking about the album Spine, which NMC released back in 2012 and which features a group of small ensemble pieces, which Tansy Davis composed in the early 2000s, which was a, a very interesting developmental period for her. I think most people would agree that Tansy Davis is one of the most distinctive voices in British music. She's often described as somebody that crosses boundaries and defies convention. And she has really enjoyed enormous success throughout her career. She's been commissioned by leading new music ensembles and major cultural institutions in the UK and across the globe. She's just told us she's just come back from, the, from Berlin where she had a wonderful performance uh, there and uh, has had, I think, three performances in Germany in the, in the past few months. So it's fantastic to hear that that music is going ahead. Uh, among standout works of the last few years, I would highlight Between Worlds, Tansy Davis's first opera, which was uh, her response to the 9-11 uh, atrocity. Fantastic uh, concerto for four French horns, uh, which uh, she wrote and dedicated to Ezra Pekka Salomon, a fellow horn player and the great you know, composer conductor. A wonderful piece called Regreening, which was uh, premiered by the National Youth Orchestra of Great Britain and which will feature on a future album of Tansy's work that we'll be releasing next year. Uh, and also Cave, uh, a very mystical, mysterious chamber opera, which was premiered by the London Sinfonietta with Mark Padmore and a regular collaborator, Elaine Michener. So that's a bit of background, and I will now hand over to Tansy and Stephen. I will rejoin you in about 40 minutes, and I will be uh, able to put your questions to Tansy and Stephen. So if you have anything you'd like to ask, please just put it in the dialogue box and we'll pick it up there. Stephen, over to you. Thanks so much, Helen. And it's uh, uh, wonderful to be here with you all today and to be uh, talking with Tansy again. Uh, Tansy and I go back a long, a long way, many happy years of collaboration at BCMG. So it's so lovely to be talking about the album Spine, which includes a couple of pieces that uh, BCMG recorded, uh, uh, Iris, and uh, which we'll hear something of in a minute, and Falling Angel. Um, so I'm immediately transported back to those recording sessions with NMC in the CBSO Centre all those years ago. Um, I've, I was lucky enough to have a couple of months away in the mountains during this summer, and I, I listened to virtually no music. Um, and then I, I immersed myself in spine in preparation for this uh, listening club. And it was the most wonderful thing. Uh, the music just hums with life, and it's a kind of charged life. Um, Paul Griffiths' uh, comment in the, in the CD booklet that uh, Tansy, your music has energized time, I think is just right. And uh, Kate Mollison on the lovely introduction to your music on your website talks about your, your music being sleek and hot. Um, I mean, for you, music is a living thing, isn't it? It's, uh, and we're, we're in it, we're not separate from it. Completely, yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's the whole way I, I compose, you know, I gather together materials and things which are just kind of objects, but to me, they have to ignite somehow, they have to be alive. And, and, and that way, that's, that, that life that they bring, that, that, that brings me into it from, from the musical objects. So um, it's all about, you know, I'm quite, quite an experimental composer really. So I, I, I try all kinds of things, sort of little games and tricks and systems and, and have a bit of fun and um, you know and, and I can I can I can make make stuff I can make patterns and I can make beautiful things but it's not really any fun until I start to get challenged by the material itself and um, and you know every day is different for me actually um, you know I can pretend I know where it's going but <laughs> I don't. But that's an interestingly thing, I, as Helen said, the spine disc actually goes right back. I mean, we're talking 2000 to 2010, pretty much the pieces on that disc. 
so 20 years, 10 years. Um, I just got a sneak preview, a couple of your recent pieces done in Germany, um, or rather not a preview, but a sneak listen. And um, I was struck by just how different they are. You're in a very different world now. The, 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 the next disc that's coming out with NMC will bridge the gap really between now and, um, and the end of the pieces on spine. I wonder what it's been like for you thinking back or looking back if you have at all um, at, at, uh, at those pieces from 2000 to 2010. Are you the same composer now that you were then? Um, no, no, I'm very different. Um, but I, yeah, I look back on my younger self and I sort of pat her on the back really. I think she was doing all right. Even though at the time I probably was, you know, full of self-criticism and everything. Um, but you know, it's, it's always been fun. Composing is always huge fun for me. And, and um, sometimes I can actually remember days of writing certain pieces. It's almost like having photographs of a day out or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take you right back to uh, dive in straight at the beginning of this CD. We're gonna hear a clip from, uh, from Iris, the sax concerto, which is the first thing on the CD. Um, and so just thinking back to that time, no, normally I would say, let's just listen to music, but I think in this case, it's helpful to hear from you first, just something about what you really see the soloist as embodying in this piece, because uh, that's important and the, and the significance indeed of the very opening sounds that we hear, because we're going to hear the beginning. Yeah, well, you know, for me, um, somehow um, the sounds and the, the musical spaces I make um, inhabit, that simultaneously inhabit a, vis a visual space most of the time. And um, register is really important for me. And it's almost like carving out a, a resonant space, which is almost like a physical space, like a, like a cave or a theater or a room of some kind. So um, I kind of like to set that up often with register. Um, and in this piece, um, it was really about exploring um, a kind of journey, a spiritual journey, a kind of shaman journey, shamanistic journey, uh, because I, I'd been reading a lot about shamanic practice at that time and um, how there's so much music in, in those traditions, um, rattles and, um, and, and really amazing songs, which are said to have come down through, through, through actual plant intelligence, which is quite an amazing thought. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I often see, you know, musicians, performers as being this, these very powerful spiritual beings that can take us on a journey of the imagination. So the saxophone is very much that it's, it's um, sort of it, within the register, it, you know, it can go very high and, and pretty low. And so it just, it carves a line through the register of the piece and activates various things within all the sort of different layers, which you could say are kind of layers of the subconscious and, and it's sort of journey through consciousness. And so um, that's what the saxophone is doing. It's, and it's, it's allied with um, percussion a lot of the time. Um, because a lot of shamanic practice has rattles and things. So um, the opening um, has got this kind of rattle-like sound, um, although it's not actually a rattle, it's just bass drums with um, uh, brushes and a very fast double bass. Um, but it's got a kind of sort of, as if it was a kind of underground rattle, perhaps, let's say. Great. So, well. so yeah, there's a lot of stuff where it's moving from low to high and that's sort of very important in terms of what, you know, where this leader, this, this spiritual leader is taking um, the audience, I think. Well, let's listen to the opening and uh, we'll hear the first couple of minutes uh, uh, until the sax gets going and, and then we'll talk again before we hear some more.
it's uh, it's awful to have to cut off at that point. Uh, just say another word about shamans, Tanzi, and um, uh, and shamanic practice, just in case uh, uh, some of us don't really know so much about what that means. What's the idea of the shaman? Well, I suppose, you know, broadly speaking, it's a kind of um, spiritual practice, which is absolutely rooted in nature and respect for nature. Um, so it's just being aware of, of, you know, like things like just simply north, south, east, west, you know, it's, it's being grounded in the earth and trying to connect with, with the earth and respect it and so on. Um, and also the, one of the, 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 the things that they're supposed to be able to do is, is connect with our ancestors, to speak with spirits, to, to, to connect with down the ancestral line and bring back kind of words of wisdom from um, ancestors to the present day to, to help with daily life. Um, but I suppose also you could say um, a shaman is a kind of visionary. If you think back to sort of 40,000 years ago with sort of cave paintings and so on, quite often that is, um, um, people talk about that having kind of parallels with shamanic practice where people were, would gather in these caves and, um, and, and view these paintings by candlelight and um, a lot of those, that kind of imagery, we don't really know what it's about, but it has resonances of, you know, spiritual realms that they're trying to understand through nature because there's lots of animals as well and there are people and they're kind of firelight. So that would have been um, uh, like almost like watching a movie in a way. But um, so I, I like the fact that it's rooted in nature and it's a completely open kind of spirituality. It's, it's, there's no dogma at all. And it's, like, it's an important idea for you, isn't it? And it's made, uh, which was also important for your opera Between Worlds and even this idea of uh, transferring between worlds, transferring energy and, you know, Between Worlds gave, gave the title as well. I want to ask you something um, about what we've just heard. Something else. Um, those uh, that string music, that music uh, with the strings. Um, I know that a lot of um, a lot of grist for your musical mill comes from early music, um, which you tend to use. You've talked about about it already, really, as found objects, rather in the way that uh, another composer you admire, Gerald Barry, uses material as found objects. Um, so not quoting exactly. Uh, and here, here it's Purcell, isn't it? There's, a, there's something Purcellian going on in those strings. Would you explain about that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, fair style, as far as I recall. Um, so that it's, I don't remember what I did, but I put it through, yeah, put it through the mill, put it through one of my grids and, and made it sound a bit strange. Um, but there is a moment sort of in the middle of the piece where the piano plays the true original briefly. And, um, and then suddenly that is, is, is kind of violently cut off by actual rattles. It almost sounds kind of Mexican actually. Yeah. And uh, actually the otherworldly sound of the strings, it's interesting because about this time, I think it was 2004, you were also presumably thinking about or about to write your piece for Concordia, the vial consort. And that vial sound is obviously in your mind there. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think I think I remember when we were ta we talked uh, beforehand earlier in the summer about excerpts, and you said when I said you know we talked about another excerpt from Iris, you said oh I'd love to hear the bit where the dances get ramped up. Um, so I think we're going to go to that in a minute, but I just wanted to say um, dance seems to be everywhere in your music, and uh, you are a, a dancer, aren't you? In a in a composer's body, rather like Stravinsky. I'm, I'm, I remember reading a wonderful story about Stravinsky and Balanchine at New York City Ballet, where at the end of rehearsals, uh, Balanchine would actually sit playing the piano, uh, and eventually put the covers on the piano, and everyone had gone. And Stravinsky would go out with the ballet dancers and buy them shoes. Marvelous, um, uh, and you know you're a dancer and dance seems to be um, always very important to you. Mm. Oh yeah. I mean, my, my rhythms are, are often ridiculously tricky to play, but I do feel them all in my body and it's, it's very important for me to, to do that. Um, but I love the, the idea of kind of layered, um, layered time as well and sort of simultaneous time and, um, and you know the impossibility of, of different tempi going on that really excites me as well. So, so let's hear some of exactly that now with uh, with a later section from Iris and all these dances going. Thank you. 
were just uh, leaving Iris there, when you were just getting into one of these grooves that uh, your music often gets into, these sort of repeated or actually not quite repeated sections. What's the attra what attracts you about these, uh, these places that you go into and you, you rather enjoy inhabiting a particular space for a time? Mm. Well, well, you know, I call it complexity funk, really. It's, right. it's um, I, I, I love grooves. I do love a good groove. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's not so easy to get them to sound good in, in the realm of contemporary music. Um, so I kind of crunch them into shape, you know, in, 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 in ways that are quite, it's quite demanding on the musicians, I have to say. But they do seem to enjoy it. I'm, I'm so, you know, lucky to have musicians that, that like playing these grooves. Um, so yeah, I like these weird um, irregular patterns that, that move the body and, and have little surprises. And um, it's, it's also very much kind of, the rhythm is also tied in with texture and uh, a kind of feeling of like, yeah, I mean, a certain kind of energy. Well, a different kind of energy now. I'm going to uh, suggest we move on to that piece that you wrote for Concordia, um, the vile consort, uh, Make Black White. And um, as we've said, often early music is a stimulus. Uh, Purcell, we've heard um, Bach, it might be Bach inventions as Scarlatti that we'll hear a bit later on in this, in this CD. Here, uh, here, the starting point is Dowland. This sort of early music interest, I wonder what the appeal is. It, is it the distance? Uh, is it something stylistic about these pieces? Mm. Um, I like the, I just like that aesthetic actually, um, um, particularly Dowland where it's the, the melancholy, which is kind of so painfully restrained, you know, I think that really appeals to me. Um, but with this melody, which is so well known, Flow My Tears, I, I just thought, it would be interesting to try and turn that sadness into a dance because, you know, sad dancing is also a beautiful thing. Um, but it, I think it becomes quite a joyful piece. And this is perhaps one of the most labyrinthine excursions into, into the temporal layering. Um, but obviously there's, there's not a massive amount of people here. It's not an orchestral piece, but I think it goes as far as it could in, in terms of demands of the players. And they did an amazing job on this. So we hear in the treble vial this uh, descending four note line of this, uh, of this lament, which is the tears on the cheek, I guess. Um, and then, as you say, you, uh, your systems take it in, a, uh, your dances take it in rather another way. So let's hear uh, the beginning uh, couple of minutes of Make Black White. Distracted dances, maybe joyful dances. Yeah, uh, <laughs> wonderful. Um, I can't help thinking of a kind of Ophelia. I don't know why, but um, uh, I want to ask you about titles, Tansy. We're going to uh, we're going to move on and uh, and listen to the title piece on the C CD spine in a moment. But 
I'm interested, do titles always come at the beginning for you? Because they often seem very important for getting pieces going, as far as I can see. Actually, they always come right at the end. Oh, there you go. I'm totally wrong. <laughs> <well. laughs> That's always the treat at the end. Yeah. Yeah, I don't let myself decide on a title. Okay. I kind of have, have working titles in mind. I always have working titles. And my scores are covered in notes and little stories and nudges because I have you know, lo lots of ideas as I go along, most of them fall by the wayside, but, um, but words- well, are sometimes start with pictures, don't they? Or is that just certain pieces? Actually, not many of them have actually, but um, the visual element, as I said earlier, is, is hugely important to me. Um, and, and with titles, you like short titles, punchy titles. Yeah, my titles are quite showy, I suppose. They're quite, but I think if a title is being being quite poetic, um, and as a kind of open door, you know, a welcome for for the listener, and um, so I want them to have energy, and I want them to be direct, and I want them to say enough about the piece to to, to sort of res resonate with with the piece. And in this case, uh, there's a there's a there's this idea of trilobites are a kind of inspiration the way trilobites grow but you don't call the piece trilobites you call it spine one syllable that's quite funny because trilobites actually don't have a spine of course because they have an exoskeleton um but the way i made the piece was i created a kind of spine for the piece so that's for me that's a kind of joke jokey title in a way but um so trilobites grow in segments um, and they, it's, I think there's about there are 12 segments and they just grow this one bit and another and another and another and they keep shedding their skin or shedding the outer outer skin of the thing as they get bigger like a snake would shed a skin and um, so I decided to use that kind of idea of 12 segments that grow and then collapse they, they, they harden and then becomes a, a soft uh, thing growing again into another segment of the of the trilobite so that's how the piece sort of grows really it follows that as so there's an inner there's a spine to the piece although there's no spine to the trilobite <laughs> actually there are some trilobites i think in in a, in a museum in birmingham this amazing lapworth museum of geology and some of them do have spines i think oh they have they, they have, have spikes spikes that's it yeah and some of them yeah they're called spines actually but they they're not actually the spine as we know it like a vertebrae sure. but they, yeah, they have those <laughs> spiky things and but what I love most about them is that they I think they were the first creatures to have eyes oh so yeah marvelous. The, story of the piece is that the, 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 there's all these low versions of it's four flutes four clarinets and they're all playing the lowest types of those instruments and then at the end there's a higher one as the as the, as the crystals form as eyes and light comes through the forest I wanted to ask you about your sound worlds because they're always very striking. And that's an amazing instrumentation, four flutes, two altos, two basses, but bass clarinets, harp, timbal and marimba. And you had a, a marvelous letter from someone after the orchestral music from Between Worlds was done, uh, responding about that. One of the things that the lady said who wrote to you, I saw was, was actually that she was gripped by the new sounds in the piece. And it always seems to me that I listen to your music and I think I've never heard that sound before. Is there something there about um, commanding our attention or maybe commanding your own attention with these new sound worlds? Yeah, I, I'm always searching for, for, for a new color. Um, that's very important to me, texture, color, shape and rhythm. And um, I, I love looking for new combinations that's why writing for orchestras is so, so much fun. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that piece, uh, what did we see is things I'm, yeah, had so much fun finding and proud of that. But this one, yeah, I mean, I didn't choose this instrumentation, mm -hmm. but it was, you know, an absolute dream to write for these instruments. Well, it's wonderful. And we're gonna hear quite a wild section, I think, of spine now. Thank you. 
So that's just a section of spine there, some of those lovely sort of hockey type rhythms that you also love that often appear in your music. We're going to move on now to one of the solo pieces on this, uh, on this CD, and actually one of the earliest pieces from 2001, um, the loopholes and linchpins. Uh, there's another found object from the Baroque here, Tansy. Yeah. Yeah, this one, um, I just took a couple of, uh, I don't know how many, I think I think a different, I think three Scarlatti sonatas. And um, I literally sort of superimposed some, some games, some systems onto them. So when this happens, this triggers this. And when this happens, that has to transpose to there and so on and so on. So I set up, set up a lot of rules and superimposed them onto the, the Scarlatti. And then, you know, my, my systems are always very kind of impromptu and, you know, I just create them as I go. And so I needed some, some escapes when they didn't work. So that was when I came up with this idea of loopholes so you can skip to this. So, um, and then the, the slower movements, I just call the linchpins because they are, they just sort of hold the thing together really. And they treat the material in a slightly different way. We're going to hear the first loophole, uh, but first, um, it's interesting because it, it sort of explodes the music in a way. And funnily enough, I found myself thinking about Cornelia, Cornelia Parker's shed, the exploded shed that was at Tate or, Tur or Turner or whatever, I can't remember. Some, there's something about these systems that are, these found objects that allow you to sort of get inside the music. Um, uh, and uh, uh, another thing I was thinking about, you know, I love mountains and uh, there's an amazing book by a writer called Nan Shepherd. I don't know if you know it, called The Living Mountain. And she, she used to go up on the Cairngorm. She wrote this in the 1940s and it was published posthumously. Um, it's one of the most amazing pieces of nature writing uh, that you'll ever read. And um, she used to say that the best way to look at a mountain is to is to put your head on the ground or even better bend down and look and look between your legs and see everything upside down and then you really inhabit it anew and it seems to me that when you take your systems to new music it's perhaps partly about making it new in that way um anyway uh that wasn't really a question was it i think we should listen to I think that's amazing it makes me think of cornelia park as exploding piano actually <laughs> oh right yeah yeah well, let's listen, let's listen to the wonderful Hugh Watkins playing uh, the, the first loophole, loophole one. just uh, not quite at the end of that, just interrupting it there, Tansy. I'm fascinated um, to know where, whether, whether you know uh, your system is going to produce those moments of stasis or conjunction in the parts or whether you just take them when they come. Because I think there is something with systems, isn't there, about the predetermination, but also having space for, for chance to happen. Yeah, so, I mean, now I, I I have a real sixth sense about my systems and I know, and they're quite complicated. So I have to be careful, you know, how much time I spend um, kind of 
unraveling them because I, I, I set them, I can set them up and, and, and set up the beginnings of them and I can see how they're going to work. But um, I only actually begin to like, as I say, unravel them or, or set them out if I know they're going to work. I think it's a bit like um, these people that can look up at the night sky and, and, and see an exploding star or something, a dying star. It's just, I've developed a, a, you know, a sixth sense for that. So I, I know they're going to work. And in terms of those moments of stasis, um, well, um, I would intervene at any moment. I, I normally, I just, because after the system set up, then I break it up and do whatever I want with it. So um, then um, I just look, I look for the music within it. So I just put, it's almost like pulling the music out of it then. And then I will quite often um, allow, the, allow the piece to breathe, just put in an extra beat or a bar or more. Well, it's, it's very interesting because it's uh, the setting it up and then jumping in at certain points. This is a sort of um, different levels of control and then letting go and then control, it's, uh, which is, which is uh, marvellous. Um, we're, we're going to, we're going to hear now Falling Angel, which is, uh, um, the other big ensemble piece on this CD and, and um, uh, a BCMG piece, very proud of having played a little part in facilitating that for, that amazing piece for you um, that we did with, uh, with uh, well, premiered with Tom Addis in, two, in 2007. And actually the starting point for this piece is, comes from visual art. Um, visual art architecture uh, uh, have been inspirations for you. Um, so talk about this, talk about where this, this came, this falling angel uh, idea. Yeah, um, this is one of the pieces that I can vividly remember composing. It's very, very strange. And uh, it felt what, very- What does it take you to right now? What are you remembering? I just remember sitting at my desk um, and with all these crazy rhythms that became these fanfares and just like throwing them on. And I don't know where they came from. And, and, um, and then I realized that Gosh, this is really uh, it's really tough, but it's 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 wild. And um, you know, the the piece that I suppose the painting which the piece is kind of most mostly about is is called Falling Angel by Anselm Kiefer. And I'm just very moved by his work as as a as a whole body actually because. Um, there, and in these series of paintings about that time with Falling Angel, he was kind of commenting on, on the, the, the fragile nature of art and, and how, um, you know, it can be, can be destroyed at any time. It can be, you know, it's, it's something that needs to be cared for. And so um, that, that's a kind of, that image was in my mind, that thought, and also the image itself of this painting of, um, it's a very dark painting. It's, it's black with a white angel on it and, and but it's 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 I think it's it's positive because it's sort of finding light in the darkness and it's sort of glinting things you know, beautiful shining things uh, like like a candle in the dark and things like that so I, I was looking for that kind of contrast in the piece sort of uh, it's quite metallic and um, a lot of Kiefer's work is extremely physical it's like it almost like looks like mud on the canvas and they're so enormous you can you can like walk into them and feel like you're walking across a field or something with this so um sort of tactile and sensual um and those textures and the layering of those uh, is, is something that really attracts you as well isn't it yeah yeah so this is this is so um so complex but um i love the idea of something that's really complex but it's also fun so that's what i'm trying to it's, it's quite an extreme piece, but it surprised me that, in fact, it's been done quite a lot by student ensembles really brilliantly. So, um, um, yeah. So there you are, pieces that you write that are really extreme and virtuosic. Five years later, students are picking them up. That's the, that's the way it goes. You, you talk about writing music that's, uh, you describe the music as black and shiny. I love this. It's something you've talked, you've talked about a lot, this idea of, uh, this color that can be black but also shiny. Mm. I guess it's like you know like we have now with people putting up their Christmas lights and so on it's that thing of winter and sparkling lights and and finding light in the darkness and um, but I like that as a color so for example the electric harpsichord in this piece is is that for me a uh, metallic shining object uh, which doesn't doesn't have much resonance therefore it's quite sort of dark but it's it's like fireworks every every key is like a little firework. 
So, um, you were talking about the, um, the virtuosity, and as I say, we we did this. Uh, I mean, it's Chris Austin on this uh, on this recording, premiered by Tom Addis. I wonder when um, when you were, knew you were writing with for Tom, of course, who's fantastically accurate uh, with with uh, tricky rhythms. Was that a was that a uh, did you think that's fine? It'll be safe. It'll be safe. I think I did actually. I think it was like you know he he would he loves a challenge. So let, let's see what we can throw throw out there. And Chris Austin, of course, the favourite uh, artist of yours, a favourite conductor. What is it about Chris that what does he bring to your music that you love so much? Um, he, he really understands the soul of it. You know, we have great conversations about, about that. And he, he, he's just very good at um, getting to the heart of things. And I, I enjoy talking to him so much about my music. He's just so sensitive um, and yeah, he knows what I want, which is, you know, brilliant for a com composer. Well, here he is delivering, um, delivering. Uh, I think we're going to go into a section with these, um, all these fanfares being hurled around uh, uh, of Falling Angel, and then we'll come back and we'll talk more about, uh, about the final clip. So this is a bit of Falling Angel. those uh, fascinating sound worlds which you think you've never heard before anywhere else. Um, those, I just want to talk to you about rhythm Tansy, those incredibly complex rhythms that you write and uh, the extent to which they're felt uh, calculated because obviously when you write a score you have to calculate them out but but I sense with you you feel you feel your rhythms very much yeah body I guess is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's all about the, the dance of it, and I, I do, I do dance physically. I do actually dance quite a lot when I'm composing. And um, I believe you even feature in a Dire Straits song. I don't know if I'm embarrassing you here, but uh, <laughs> Mark, Knopfler, Mark Knopfler wrote you into a song when he saw you dancing with some friends at one of his gigs. I think you told me that eight years ago. That's amazing. That's, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm interested because you like. Um, a friend of yours, Morgan Hayes, who who also feels this rhythm viscerally, and I've seen him in rehearsals jolting physically, like an electric charge mm -hmm. has gone through him when he's listening to the music he's written. And you know, in within a kind of, if you like, classical music tradition, and I know we're talking contemporary, but within that tradition, you know, audiences tend to be rooted to the spot rather. Things have changed over the last. 10, 20 years, I guess, things are a little bit more informal. Do you see audiences move to your music? I mean, do you like it if you see audiences move? Good question. Um, I, haven't, I haven't been to a concert for so long, I can't remember. But yeah, generally speaking, I don't think they do much, but yeah, there's always, there are some that do. And, you know, that's a, obviously a triumph if, if, if I can do that. Um, but yeah, it's internalized. I, I want to ask you about recordings. Um, 
here we are. It's the uh, recordings fix fix a piece, you know, fix a fix a version. Um, and I, I want to ask you first of all if you re if you enjoy the recording process and also just how important it is for you uh, to get your pieces out on on an NMC CD. Oh, recordings are just wonderful, you know, and they're they're treasures, they're they're gifts, really. You know, it's it's. And they're very hard to get together because they're expensive and, and uh, you know, it's a lot of work. So, um, yeah, it's a dream to have more things recorded. So I'm absolutely delighted that there is another CD in the pipeline for an MC. Um, I mean, it would be amazing to, to have more, to spend time, you know, in the studio with an orchestra would be fantastic. But in terms of orchestral recordings, um, you know, it's tricky because I, I tend to revise things, generally speaking. So, you know, it's hard to, um, to get more than a few performances where there are recording, uh, you know, facilities at that, the one you, that you've got right, you know, as the composer you've got right. Well, so, it's interesting you say that actually, because the score that I have here of Falling Angel, I very proudly have from when, I think this is your original score of Falling Angel. And when I listen to it with, uh, along with uh, this CD, of course, it's slightly different because a few little, you, you tweet some things uh, and, you know, everything you did seemed absolutely right. Although I also thought the premiere sounded absolutely right. So you're kind of magician, but um, so it's fascinating. I think composers often revise things and they're often structural, aren't they? They're often, I think in, in this case, it's just nips, nips and tucks here and there. Yeah, yeah, it is. Although, um... There's one, there's one section of Falling Angel, which is actually basically the first three minutes, which I just loved so much. I just repeated it halfway through the piece. I dropped it in again. <laughs> That's lovely. And uh, in, in a minute, we're going to hear uh, actually a, um, a slow section. In fact, we'll, we will go to this. Um, um, it's everything slowed down in this, uh, in this uh last couple of minutes that we'll hear from about two thirds into the piece. And I'm struck by um, the fact that when, we, when we're in this slowed down universe, the various things that are going on that we'll hear, I mean, there's a sort of cor anglais and used trumpet melody and there's some other brass punchy chords and the, well, there's various different things. Uh, everything seems to be being itself. That's the first thing, every, every, every bit. And it takes me back to this, um, to Nan Shepherd, who uh, this wonderful lady writing her book about the Cairngorms and the mountains, the living mountain it's called. Um, and she said that the other thing about when she looked between her legs on upside down at the world and the mountains was that not only did she find that it enabled her to inhabit the world rather than, if you like, tame it by looking at it normally, but also that, um, all the focal points became multiple, multiple focal points by seeing something new. And it struck me li listening to your, listening to this music that in your layering of things, everything still is very present, multiple focal points. Does that chime with you? Yeah, yeah. And I think this slow passage is kind of a reveal as well, because there's there are always moments where I I peel back all the, the, the shiny dancing and this, something maybe you could think see of it see it as a kind of calm heart of the piece somehow and um so that i think that this passage does function as something like that for me um but there's there's another kind of um important aspect to this to the sound of this piece actually which is that there's a steel pan which is um kind of again that's kind of at the heart of the sound of the piece because um I, I hear the steel pan as being, it's got this metallic hit, you know, top end hit to it, but it's got this very kind of dark and fruity sound as well that comes out. And, and so I think the piece has got, it's got those two sides. It's got this really high metallic dancing. And then this section is the kind of dark fruity stuff. Um, Wonderful. So, yeah. Well, we should hear it. This is the last music we'll hear and then uh, we'll hand back to Helen.
So, hello again, I'm back. And I really hesitate to interrupt such a, a profound and engaging conversation. And uh, I'm also congratulating myself on having such a fabulous disc in the catalog, actually. Um, it's uh, wonderful to, to go through it with you, Tansy, sort of with your sense of revisiting it, re-inhabiting it, and uh, kind of remaking it almost, you know, in words for the viewers. I think it's such a, such a treat. And um, they've obviously been listening very intently because we've got a few questions which really do pick up on some of those themes that uh, you and Stephen have been exploring. So I'm going, to, I'm going to go to one of them now. And this is about the sort of revisions point, you know, the, you know going back and listening to music that, as Stephen pointed out, was composed 20 years ago. Um, so this is a question from one of our, one of our viewers. Uh, given the passage of time, does Tansy ever go back and edit previous works? Um, we know that you do, but is that a general aspect of your approach to composing? So is that something you kind of plan in or imagine yourself doing? You know, do you finish something? Do you feel that sense of that's it, draw a line, goodbye, or never? I think I think I've just been sort of getting better as a composer during those last 20 years. And so um, I've done a, a lot of revising of things in the last, I would say, 10 years because I've just got better at, 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 at the kind of the, the, the kind of orchestration and the technique and and um, allowing things to breathe and things like that. So they're the kind of things I've tweaked. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm not afraid to go back and and it's not necessarily unpick something because I wouldn't go back and find out what I did. I wouldn't go back and analyze it and 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 kind of reweave it together according to the the logic that I was thinking at that time. But I would I would come at it with you know um, a bit more experience and ideas about how to make it sing a bit more. Um, at the same time, though, I think it's also really important to to recognise that some of the decisions I made, at, you know, that for example, in in Lure, the, the solo violin piece on that disc, you know, at the time um, I felt that it was, you know, I might have felt a little bit, oh, maybe that doesn't quite work. It sounds a bit like it's trying to be. Um, a kind of a sensual moment, but it actually it doesn't really sit well enough on the strings. But um, so it sounds like a really fragile thing. But but you know that was what I wanted at the time. But then standing up and saying yes, that was what I wanted is is another thing. So it's important not to interfere also and to look look back at those things and see, you know, um, as I said earlier, I pat myself on the back really because they, you know five years ago I might have thought, oh dear, that, that wasn't very good, that wasn't very good. But I'm mature enough now to go, actually, that was really great. And I couldn't do that now because I, it's just, you know, life has, has taught me other things. Um, but it's really interesting. Um, the most recent premiere I had was uh, a string quartet um, for the, the Arditis. And um, there's actually no changes. <laughs> apart from maybe maybe a, a, a tempo change at the end but tiny and so maybe that's a, a corner i've turned there's a, another question that uh, that that we received which was about recording actually and does the knowledge or anticipation that a piece is going to be recorded does that affect you in any way do you feel very conscious of that and do you feel that that affects how you write or Make, how you make certain decisions is, is that at the back of your mind the sense of it isn't just a performance it's going to be something somehow preserved yeah and in forever. terms of in terms of you know the the reach of the piece that would be very exciting to me so um that's more i suppose of a, a sort of practical or career question um okay. because if if someone comes to me and says will you write a piece and we're going to record it um you know, even if they've not got much money, um, I would be really interested to um, to take on that commission because mm. you know, a recording is a very, very precious thing. Mm. Exciting to do. And when you are uh, thinking about recording, actually, and and now in current circumstances, and the sort of the need to be very inventive about space between players, 
does that idea excite you? Is it just a pain? You know, I mean, clearly it affects how players hear each other, doesn't it? It's, it's um, and the ensemble. And is that something that you've thought about or have you just been too busy in the past few months to really kind of yeah, I haven't turned that into kind of creative use? Yeah, no, I haven't actually thought about that because in fact, everything I'm working on at the moment um, for, for yeah, most of this year actually has been for pretty small groups. So I haven't had to think about that actually. Yeah. Um, I hope I hope I will have to think about it. <laughs> you never know. So we've got another really interesting question, which uh, again picks up on the dance theme, um, and clearly that has really sort of got through to to our to our viewers. So, given the conversation about dance, do you ever consider how your music will appear visually in performance? And if so how does it influence your writing? So is there a visual dimension to your work? And is that, is there something about what happens on stage visually, the sort of interconnection between players that kind of inspires you? Um, I suppose it's more, uh, it's, it's to do with the, the drama of an, an individual musician, you know, quite often I write for people I know. So I, I definitely picture them playing it and the physicality of that. Um, but that's probably as far as it goes in terms of my idea of like, I don't really think about how to like pro produce a concert, although that would be another thing I would be interested in getting into, but it would be very separate to my, my yeah. composing. Um, I suppose- There's tremendous drama in your electric, use of electric guitar. I mean, isn't that, that's in itself has a, has a tremendous impact or some of your other instruments you talk about. Um, uh, other instruments that you've used and kind of that are sort of surprising uh, in yeah. conventional context. Exactly. Yeah. So, th so there is that. There's that theatricality, I suppose, rather than a kind of um, design choreography aspect. Yeah. 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 So we've got another question, which is about instrumentation. Um, do you spend much time with instrumental players, such as bass clarinet, and uh, do you, do they sort of do you spend time with them in order to find out what works best? You know that thing of sort of developing your your empathy with the player, if you like. Um, well, I, I really love working with with uh, developing relationships with players, um, like for example Christine Chapman from Music for a Breather, a horn player who I've been working with quite a lot, and as you mentioned, Elaine Michener and you know yeah. other singers. Um, so that's a great joy. Um, and with with that come you know comes technical uh, discoveries, um, but it's um, when I'm looking for sort of extended ish techniques and so on, um, I I tend to sort of um, maybe find one or two new things and that satisfies me quite a lot. Um, I, I'm I'm not sort of scouring the, the technique books and, and asking players to go through things with me. I tend to find ways of creating microtonality through juxtaposition of uh, sort of octave, octaves and things like that. And rather than actually asking individual players to do multiphonics and things like that. Mm. So um, yeah, it's more about the, the empathy you talk about is, is, is like, what, does, what would this person love to play, you know, and um, how, how can I get the best out of them? And, but at the same time, hopefully I want the piece to have a life beyond that individual, but there's a lot of um, sort of, I, I do get a buzz out of working with musicians and, and, and talking to them about it. And with the horn piece I just wrote for, for Christine Chapman, I, as a horn player, I did actually do a lot of playing myself or the horn and recorded lots of about, you know, uh, literally 40 minutes of strange noises that I made and sent them over to her. And, uh, and she was sort of trying to, trying to play those and saying, how did you do that? So that was, that was huge fun. Um, so yeah, in terms of, I do like to sort of search for new sounds in that way, but I, I don't need that many, but the interaction with a musician is, 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 is really wonderful. So there's another sort of instrumental question um, that we have here, which is kind of rather an, uh, an, an interesting question uh, from Northampton Bach Choir via Twitter. So what's the instrument you least like writing for or the instrument you have avoided writing for and why? <laughs> 
Ah, how, what have I avoided? Maybe it just hasn't, you just haven't had the opportunity, maybe. I can't imagine you avoiding things. I can, I can imagine you running towards something actually pretty outlandish and like out there somehow. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I regret not having yet fully sort of got to know the cello. Oh, interesting. I'm a cellist, actually. Oh. <laughs> so that, that needs to happen. Yeah. And that, that's such an incredible instrument with, with so much weight of history and beauty and everything else that goes with it, feeling and so on. Um, so I need, to, I need to do that. I need to find a really good way to relate to cello. So it's clearly hovering out there somehow. Mm. Yeah. And people say about the cello that the thing is it's it's kind of because of where it sits, you know, if, if it's an orchestral piece that it's that cut through is very, you know, that, that presents sort of technical challenges. So. Possibly. And the, but the range is amazing. Yes. Um, and there are some wonderful, wonderful cellists. Absolutely. Around. So is any other no shortage of players. Writing a lot for horn. Um, yeah, I, I'm not. I, I haven't avoided any. Stephen, what do, what do you think? Uh, what instrument should Tansy tackle next? If you were if you were commissioning her? Well, now it would be cello, of course. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I would always. Uh, you know, the, that's that's it, though, isn't it? It's always uh, trying to find out really what uh, what does a composer want to do. You know what's. What's in, what's in Tanzi's mind? I remember with the with the piano concerto Nature, which is on the new disc that'll come out next April, with Hugh Watkins playing and conducted by uh, Ollie Nussen, late lamented. Um, I remember with that Tanzi, you you know you 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 came with you, you. I think we'd had a conversation and you'd really wanted to write for Hugh, didn't you? And that was a that was him actually as much as the piano. But uh, it's always always about um, no. I, so I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't dare to suggest, I would try and find out what's the thing you want to write. There is something I wanted to ask Tansy, it's just going back to shamans actually and the shamanic rituals, it's ritualistic and I was thinking of you composer as shaman. I wondered whether whether when you compose, since since shamans have sort of come into your life and into your music, is there a ritual, do you, do you is there a ritual around your composing? Oh yeah, yeah, I have to have. Um, I have to have at least one candle, and uh, <laughs> and um, what colour? <laughs> white, white. That that welcomes the uh, any helpers, any spirit helpers that want to come and help me out. I'll take all the help I can get. So I call <laughs> them in with a candle, and um, I have to feel very relaxed and calm and, and peaceful to be working. So um, it does feel like a spiritual practice, if I'm honest. And, um, you know, some pieces, you know, you go, you have to go deeper than others, for example, between worlds, when I was dealing with death uh, all the time for a long, long time in the music, um, then I did feel, I honestly felt a massive spirit presence and um, that, that that was helping me through the piece. And I was, I was somehow serving that uh, kind of army of, of spirits around me. But um, I do feel, yeah, it's what I do is a kind of channeling, um, whether, you know, call it what you like, but I, I do acknowledge there are things, there are invisible things that, you know, we don't understand and music is a very powerful invisible thing. And so um, I just feel that, you know, I to try and be like an aerial and, 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 and tune into things, ideas, spirits, whatever it is that's around. So yeah, I have my candles. And um, I do. I also do a bit of Reiki uh, practice myself, so I do. I do have um, some rituals around that as well. I'm interested. You talk about channeling uh, this idea of, in a way, opening yourself up to these things. And you, someone who taught you is a good friend of yours, Simon Holt, uh, and his uh, his love of Spanish culture. Lives, obviously, had spent a lot of time in Spain. We always talk about duende. You know, this idea, this force that really comes up from the earth through a performer or through a Composer, I guess, uh, slightly different ideas, but there's, it, there's a similar, there's a similar um, opening up there, isn't there, to oh, the possibility yeah. of um, of something extraneous? Yeah, that's so. That's that's getting power from from below rather than yeah. above. But, yeah. but that's you know equally you know interesting and exciting. And I think I personally feel that in Bert Whistle's music as well. It feels like 
the volcanic and, and Simon Holt's music has that similar yeah. vibe to me. Well, listen, both of you, it's been absolutely amazing to be part of this really rich conversation. And I know that uh, people watching will be very sad that we have to, to bring it to a close, but unfortunately our time is up. So thank you both so much for an extraordinary exchange of ideas and musical thinking and spontaneity actually responding to each other's sort of perceptions and um, ideas. And uh, I hope you'll come back again very soon to talk about your, <laughs> your forthcoming disc, Tansy. It'd be great to, to have another, another session like this with you, with you both. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it as, as much as we have. And if you'd like to know more about NMC recordings, please do sign up for the newsletter. And there you'll be told about new recordings, new events like this one and uh, special releases and special offers. So don't, don't miss out. Come and be part of the NMC family. We look forward to seeing you again. So until then, good night. <laughs> <laughs>